Great. Okay, great. Well, again, thank you, Janak, for joining us here. Um, like to introduce PB Bank Shares, PBBK ticker. It's a Coatesville, um, Pennsylvania based thrift. Jack, you'll have to remind us about how far outside of Philadelphia are you? We're roughly 40 minutes outside of Philadelphia. Okay, so about 40 minutes, um, just west, I believe, down mainline to Philadelphia. Um, publicly traded bank, it was a thrift conversion from July 2021. So you're coming up on your three year anniversary. Um, and the stock is trading way below tangible book value with, and you have a history of um, of creating value in the space, being very shareholder, uh, very shareholder um, friendly, very shareholder creative. So we're happy to welcome you here, Janak. Thank you for being here. I'm going to uh, mute myself and show your your slides, and then just let us know when we can come back for Q and A. Okay. So if we start at page four, and for those of you who are new and are not familiar with PB Bank shares. Page four will show you a history. The bank was actually founded in 1919. So it's been around for 104 years. And I got to the company in September, October of 2019. So, it, it, you know, since 2019, we've been going through a transition uh, from a standpoint of uh, not only adding new talent, but changing products and all those kind of things. In 2021 is when we do mutualized. We converted from a mutuals to a stock savings bank. In 2022, we, we got Bauer five-star rating. When I joined the bank with a three-star rating, we've got best places to work. And in 2023, once again, we've got best places to work. So culture is really important to me and I'll touch on that. If you look at page five, you'll see our management team. We have 125 years of combined industry experience. Uh, I feel we have a good depth in here and a rich depth uh, in our management team. Page six will show you our culture, and I'm really focused in on this. This is what drives me every day. It's really making sure people work towards their purpose. And purpose is really important to me. You know, why do I wake up in the morning? What drives me? And I want to make sure the employees that work with us, they, their purpose is aligned to our company's purpose. When I came to the bank, the bank had no real strategic vision, no plan, no direction, no culture. I got 18 of our employees, and over three months, I had them develop our purpose statement. We'll strive to be the most loved bank that allows our families, customers, and communities to prosper and our values. I wanted this to be a bottom-up approach, not a top-down approach, right? Get a marketing company in here and then you develop something and say, now everybody believes in it. I wanted it to happen the other way, right? So a bottom-up approach. And for me, the more you can drive people to play to their purpose, their strengths every day, the more successful we'll be. You know, I use a simple example. You know, if someone wants to save dolphins, they come to a, the bank every day to work. When they come in at eight o'clock, they're gonna be miserable. When they leave at five o'clock, they're probably gonna be happy because they're not playing to the strengths. So we really want people to play to the strengths. We have turned over the employees since I've come to the bank, we've turned 70% of them over. And the reason is I want people to play to their strengths. You know, the, the more they play to the strengths, the more successful they'll be. We've implemented a new healthcare program, a new 401k program. When I came to the bank, uh, our, uh, participation in the 401k program was 60% with a national provider, nothing wrong with them. We've gone to a local provider who, with whom we have a relationship from a profit sharing. We now have 100% participation in our 401k program. Once again, it engages the employee into what we're doing every day. If you look at page seven, you'll see our relationship-based team. We have something called White Glove Service. And on page eight, I'll expand on that White Glove Service uh, and page eight and page nine. But if you look at page eight, you'll see our core operating markets, right? On the right-hand side, our traditional branches, Coatesville, Oxford, um, Georgetown, and New Holland. And then we have loan production offices in Lancaster and one in Harrisburg. This is our traditional marketplace. This is where we compete. We go a little bit more outside of this circle when we get referrals, but this is our core operating market, these 10 markets. If you take Chester County, Chester County is one of the wealthiest uh, counties in Pennsylvania. If you take the country, I'm sure it's in the top 20, 25. So Chester County is a very strong county. If you take Lancaster County, very conservative, you're not gonna get 10% growth there. You, if the national economy grows at 10%, Lancaster is gonna grow at 2%. But when the downside happens, Lancaster is not gonna experience that downside either. And then you, you take Harrisburg, Harrisburg's the, the capital of Pennsylvania. So we feel we're in very good, strong, vibrant markets. We also have regional boards. We have our main 
Bank Board, but we also have a regional board in Lancaster and one in Harrisburg as well, which continues to drive our referrals. If you look at page nine, just to go into our business model and how we execute, we have something called white glove service. If you take our size, we tell I tell customers, we can't be everything to everyone, right? We don't do car loans. We don't do student loans. We don't do your traditional home equity loans, right? We don't do residential mortgages. We don't do credit cards. What we do is commercial. 95% of our business is commercial, and that's what we stick to. And what we do is something called white glove service. We tell customers, we come to you. You do not come to us. We gain our cars, and we drive to our customers. To give you two quick examples, we had a, a prospect we were developing over nine months, owns 30 different pizza huts, pizza hut locations. And they made the decision, yep, we're going to switch to you from a large regional player to you, right, a local community player. Our custom, our employee went to their office, onboarded 30 of those accounts, onboarded every ACH, all those kind of things within three days, right? So we tell customers, we come to you with another customer who had 108 online payments within their accounts. They were going through a merger, decided to come to us. Our employee went to their office, onboarded everything. So we tell customers, you don't lift a finger, whether you got five bill pays, five ACHs, or you got 108, we take care of everything. We went through new branding, new products. If you take our cash management, we can compete with the big boys. We've got 90% of what they have. We don't have the SWIFT. We don't have international wires at, at, at the desktop, right? All those kind of things. But we have what local customers want. One area where we've been successful is we've actually caught, uh, come across some gas stations where they haven't had a borrowing need, but they have a deposit need. So we've uh, contracted with Shields. Customer has a contract directly with Shields. We actually put a safe in their location, is bolted to the ground, right? All the cash goes in there, reaches a certain limit. Shells pick it up. We have a virtual vault we've created. Uh, we have eight of these machines out there. We pay nothing on their deposits, right? So it's been a great opportunity for us to generate more and more deposits. Uh, if you look at our top 50 borrowers, 96% are new to the bank in the last three years. You look at our top 100 deposit customers, 94% are new to the bank in the last three years. And to just touch on the deposit uh, piece, if you take our deposits, our deposits are changing and they're changing in terms of customer profile. The mix has changed a little bit, but it's more the customer profile that's changing. From the second quarter to the third quarter, deposits did go down, but that was more strategic because we had these, some of these customers who kept on every two months, what have you done for me lately? What have you done for me lately? And they weren't really relationship-based uh, customers. So we really transitioned out of that. As of December 31st, 2022, our non-interest bearing comprised 9% of our deposits. As of September 2023, it comprised 13%. So you can see our focus more on that commercial. It's, it's coming through. Interest bearing checking went from 27% to 26% pretty stable money market where we've seen the fluctuation. It's gone down from 18% to 16% and savings is the biggest one down from 8% to 6%. But once again, we're more focused on that non-interest bearing. CD is relatively the same, 38%, 39%. Page 10 will show you our asset growth, loan growth, deposit growth. With Our goal is to keep uh, asset growth uh, at least, you know, we, we've been successful at 23% company annual growth rate, uh, 20 uh, 24 will suddenly be more challenging. For our loan growth and deposit growth, we've been trying to keep that as even as possible. Obviously, in the third quarter, we did have that strategic move to get rid of some deposits. We just we didn't feel we're enhancing our franchise value. If you look at page 11, you'll see our loan composition. And you'll see the CRE composition, the blue pie, has continued to increase, right? It's gone from 103 million to 159. At the same time, the CNI owner occupied has gone up from 42 to 74 million. We've been shrinking the green bar, uh, green pie, which is basically the, the pure residential uh, portfolio. We don't do residential mortgages. We're, we've been out of that since um, the beginning of 2020. To give you a little more color on this uh, CRE, if you go to page 12, you'll see we basically have stress tests uh, our portfolio. We do it every quarter on the CRE side, any loan above 250,000, we st stress test. So we've stress tested 73% of our portfolio. Our average loan to value is 63%, uh, debt coverage ratio 138, uh, and that's without guarantor or sponsor support. Office exposure, I know that's a big hot item. We have five loans in that segment, 9.5 million, but they're all medical space. Four of them are to dentist, and one is to a lease where we have with Penn State Hershey. So we don't have the traditional office exposure, office space, it's more medical 
related. Average loan to value 73%, debt coverage ratio 1.4 times. Hospitality, big topic as well. We have five loans, 17.4 million. Average loan to value 56%, debt coverage ratio two times without guarantor and sponsor support. Once again, these are flag properties, people we know, people that have been in our community for a long time and we've done business with them and we have a full relationship. Page 13 shows our top five priorities. These have not changed from the beginning of last year. So we've been focused on these since 2022. Deposit growth, loan growth, cash management, and not-for-profit, attract talent, and continue to maintain our credit quality. Page 14, we've, you know, I've done, if you take these presentations, we follow them with SEC, right? But I've done individually with people in our communities, uh, customers, CNR, uh, COIs, potential customers, 589 of these this year. And I use this chart because this chart is very telling, right? When you sit down and explain to them, the left-hand side has not been updated and I can't get new data on it since December of 2022, but we talk about our uninsured deposits. Our uninsured deposits are 12.4%. You look at the average industry, it's 43%. So we feel very comfortable from a standpoint of where our uninsured deposits are. If you go to page 15, we have uh, availability to meet those uninsured deposits with liquidity sources at 434%. So that's really helped us get more and more deposits. And that's where we're changing the deposit mix profile from a customer standpoint. Um, and not necessarily, we're not seeing that huge fluctuation coming our CDs going into checking or anything like that. Page 16, 17 talks about cash management. We have ICS. Um, I think right now we have eight customers on ICS when SVB collapse happened, we did open ICS to all our customers. We, we had two at that time on ICS, we now have eight. So we've had customers who've said they're very comfortable, they don't need it. If you go to page 20, you'll see our nine month results there. You'll see our pre-tax income uh, continues to increase quarter after quarter, non-accrual loans continue to go down. When I joined in 2019, you can see where the non-accrual loans were 182 or delinquents at the beginning of that year was 7.99%. We continue to drive non-accrual loans down. The bottom left chart shows you really our efficiency. When I joined, we were at 5.42 million assets per FTE. We're now at 11.3 million. We continue to become more and more efficient. Part of that is what we've done is on our loan uh, system, we've implemented a Brigo, which is life of the loan, and we've utilized it fully. So when an RM goes on a call, they would input the information and that feeds right into the credit write-up, feeds all the way through into Laser Pro. Before Laser Pro documents used to take us four hours to produce, now you can do them in five minutes. The other advantage of um, this life alone system is it automatically sends email reminders to customers for financial information, quarterly information. If they upload the information through the link, it spreads the financials as well, right? So we've created a lot of efficiencies. Part of Abrigo as well, when I came to the bank, we had 12 different spreadsheets pulling information from different sources. Now we have one source of truth, Abrigo go, going right into our core. So we run CRE stress testing through Abrigo. We run CECL through Abrigo as well. So we've created a lot of efficiencies through Abrigo. You'll see our allowance. We continue to build our allowance. There are banks um, last year, beginning of this year, and even in the most recent quarter, continue to add money back to the earnings from allowance. We're not doing that. We continue to build our allowance. Uh, I think that will really help us in 2024 and will give us more flexibility. Yeah. Page 21 shows you our earnings. Obviously, you can see the second line item, interest expense, right? Uh, common for everybody. We've continued to see interest expense increase. Non-interest expense, we've held that line pretty well. And then you can see we've been focused on making sure we continue to add to earnings and earnings per common share continues to increase from last year to this year. Page 22 shows you uh, basically our balance sheet and shows you uh, also our AOCI. Our AOCI has had held pretty steady. It's actually come down. Our average life for our securities portfolio is 1.44 years. So we've kept it very short uh, deliberately. Page 23 shows you a lot of different metrics is here. Uh, I know there's a lot of information on here. If you uh, Once again, if you look at our ROA and ROE, yep, we know we need to improve on those. Net interest margin has been impacted coming down from March to where we are in September. Allowance continues to increase. When I came to the bank, our allowance to non-accrual loans was 41%. So pretty happy where we are today. And then you can see also a book value continues to uh, increase over time as well. And then last one is page 24. You'll see 
uh, reconciliation back to tangible uh, book. We did uh, uh, buy back shares this year and we do have our buyback in place. So we'll continue to buy back shares through the rest of this year and going into next year. And then last, sorry, there was one other thing I'll touch on. We're big on page 25 and 26, you'll see Make-A-Wish. This is something that we do internally through our employees. We continue to raise money and we uh, fulfill one wish at a time for kids that are in our local communities. So I'll open up to questions or any comments. Great, that was very impressive, Janak, and you've done a lot in three years and um, in a tough interest rate environment. So I think that that's uh, really impressive. I've got a bunch of questions, but um, there are a bunch here as well. But while I'm kind of going through the, the questions in the queue, um, maybe you can just remind us uh, of your background, of, of uh, the banks you were with prior to coming to, um, to Coatesville and what happened to those? And I'll just line up this Q&A. Yeah, sure. So uh, originally started Fulton, went to Harry Savings Bank, which is a thrift uh, that converted into Waypoint. I was not part of the larger management team when it was sold to uh, Sovereign Bank, but I was one of the three founders when we started Greystone Bank. And then we started Greystone Bank in 2005. We grew it um, through, organically and then through acquisition. And then in 2011, 2012, it was sold to Susquehanna Bank. And then I went down to Florida, was part of Sunshine Bank. We, when I, th I think when we got there, it was around 200 million assets. Uh, did a couple of acquisitions, organic growth. Uh, it was roughly a billion dollars. And then that was sold to Center State Bank. Okay. All right. Good. Yeah. So, as I said, a history slide. Um, so, here we'll ask a, a, one of the questions, Q. If, uh, you know, you, had, you came with, big plans for transitions, you know, to transition um, this kind of sleepy thrift into uh, something with some real franchise value um, in, in your footprint. Where, what inning uh, are you in that process, would you say? You're using a baseball term, right? <laughs> uh, um, I'm not a big baseball guy. So you ah, to, I know. You'll have to help me. <laughs> well, how, I mean, how, how far, uh, is there um, a cricket? Along, uh, you know, cricket, yeah, yeah, cricket or football. Um, so in terms of creating franchise value, you know, from a foundational standpoint, I think we've done everything we need to, right? And it's just now executing, and we've been executing from a sales standpoint, but just it's more the sales side. Um, so from a foundation standpoint, we have everything in place, right? Abrigo was a big lift for us. Abrigo has taken us 18 months, but we are definitely seeing all the benefits of Abrigo, right? We have 36 employees, right? I don't think we need to add anymore. We can continue to build this, right, to a certain level before we need to add again, right? So I, I feel very comfortable at our size right now and the FTE composition. There are a couple of things that are coming up for us next year. In September of next year, our core contract is coming up for renewal. At the same time, our IT infrastructure co contract is coming up for renewal. Our IT um, uh, contract actually cost, cost us more than our core, right? So um, there will be some added expense in the first and second quarter of next year for our IT. And then the fourth quarter, we are going to move transition away from this contract and we, the full savings will come through in 2025 from the IT contract. So, so the contract uh, renewal is a good thing. It's not going yes. to, and so it's going to, be, and, and um, what kind of term is that contract for? About how many years? The I, Sorry, the IT contract expires in uh, September of next year. So for, we're going to move, renew it for about how many years? We're going not going to renew it. We're, we're oh, moving okay. away from it completely. Okay. And uh, we have no control over our IT infrastructure right now. So we're going to move to a, a, a uh, environment where we have more control, more flexibility, right? And we're not tied into a contract. Good, good. Because those can be problematic, yeah. <laughs> as you know, um, yeah. when you're evaluating options. So that's good. Um, just speaking about expenses, and, and you've been getting good loan growth. So I want to ask you about that as well. But your expense base uh, hasn't it been going down? Um, yeah, your your expenses were down sequentially again. Um, some somewhat heroic in a interest and inflationary um, environment. Um, I know it's not easy to do. You know, 
questions. So thank you. So um, yeah, can you talk about any, you, you just mentioned um, this potential for cost reduction, but do you see overall expenses? Can you hold it and if, if not go down, even maintaining your, your pace of growth? Yeah, so you know the mantra I've always been using is, uh, you know, our revenues have to grow twice the pace of expenses, right? And that's the mantra I've been using. Um, you know, you throw in deposit costs, it's kind of thrown us this year. Uh, otherwise, we were very successful on, on that part. As far as expenses, I don't see any large expenses coming through. We're we're lean and mean. Uh, if you look at my office right now, I don't have an office. I walk in a cube, right? I don't have a fancy table, nothing. Right. I'm actually boring the IT guy's office, so it's quieter. Um, so we're lean and mean. Uh, we, we, we don't have a lot of fat here. So from an expense standpoint, I think we've controlled it very well. Where we see the opportunities next year is definitely with a, a core contract and then with our IT contract. Hey, th that's That sounds great. I mean, that's usually the second or third, probably the third largest expense, right, for a bank. Yeah. So um, to hear you managing that, that's great to hear. Somebody had asked... Um, who is your core provider, um, and how's that differ? How's that different from the IT provider? And then, um, who is the IT provider, and, and who are you going to? I, I I'm curious too. Yeah. Yeah. So core is uh, by a company called DCI. They're out of Kansas City. Uh, when I came to the bank, I had never heard of them, and there's good and bad, right? If you think about all cores, you know, um, the advantage of DCI is they have one core. If you go to FISA, they probably have 10 different cores. And given our size, we're going to be lumped into um, a group where the innovation isn't going to take place. With DCI, the nice thing we've, uh, we've experienced is uh, they listen to us. We have a direct dial to the CEO's cell number. They have one core and they continue to invest in it. So we, you know, they're giving us 90% of what we need. And with any core, you're going to find that. You know, you're going to get 90% of what you need. You're not going to get 10%. So we're, we're very comfortable with the core. With the IT, I don't want to mention the company's name, um, but we are going to be transitioning away from them and we're going into an in-house uh, environment. Okay. And, and the, the core is, um, the core DCI. expires when, the core agreement? Uh, September of next year. Okay. Okay. And, um, and uh, yeah, I've, now I'm worried about running out of time for questions. Um, so the loan growth has been great. I, I want to get this um, in, and I think um, we had one or two questions about it. But, you know, your stock is just trading so cheap. Uh, in the 70s, 70 percent, um, you can look at my at a glance where I adjust for the interest rate marks that we know about. And any way you cut it, um, the stock is trading yeah, in the 60s to 70 percent. Um, and, and you're coming up on your three year. Uh, it's something of an anomaly, honestly, but you're taking advantage of that and you're buying back stock, which is great to see. Um, can you talk about, um, so I have calculated that you're maybe halfway into a 10% authorization. Is that rough, roughly That's accurate? Correct. Okay, so yeah. about 5% more to buy back and, and yes. you've been executing. Can you just talk about, um, you know, if you're seeing any challenges with volume or, um, you know, if you're if it's uh, on, uh, you know, executing as planned. Yeah, we're not seeing uh, many challenges on volume and it's it's going as planned. So we have a 10 5, uh, 5B1 plan in place uh, to buy back, back, buy back the stock. So it's going as, as we've planned. Okay. Okay. So there it's, it's going, going fine. Um, well, it's good to see, you know, it's a big part of your uh, tangible book per share progression, um, which is what stocks should, be reflecting in the in the price to tangible book at some point. Um, we had a question about your CRE uh, split between owner occupied and um, non owner occupied. I guess I don't have that on the um, on the summary sheet. I know it's in the call report, but can you just remind us how that breaks down? Yeah. So um, our commercial industry, including owner occupied, is roughly what is it seventy four million twenty three percent, and then our pure CRE is forty eight percent of our loan portfolio. Okay. Okay. And, um, and, and how about just quickly on real estate trends in your, for commercial real estate, how is that trending? Yeah, it's interesting. You know, Chester suburban, County, right? Yeah, Chester County, it's, it's remaining very strong. If you, uh, if there are properties that come on the market, especially from a commercial standpoint, they're not staying on too long, right? The pure office, absolutely, right? Because of the work from home. 
uh, but people are, uh, you know, employers are going back to work three, four days a week uh, in our communities. But if you take the other segments, they're holding on pretty well. Um, properties don't sell the market too well. Um, housing prices continue uh, very, very good. Uh, Chester County average median sales price last year was five hundred fifty thousand dollars for a home. Right. So, um, and if we take Lancaster, Lancaster is very stable, and so is Harrisburg. Okay. All right. All right. Good to hear. Good to hear. And um, you know, with the with the three year anniversary approaching, and and all the work that you've done that you put in place, you know, what kind of ROA? Uh, and I know you're R, you have a lot of excess capital, so that kind of affects the ROE. But on an ROA um, basis, you should be set, I think, to to show some acceleration. Um, I think the wind's more at your back now than it has been. Um, what kind of, um, you know, ROA targets near term, you know, are are reasonable or are, are feasible? Mm -hmm. You know, I... I, I, I... With where interest rates are right now and where the Fed's going to hold them for a while, and I, you know, who knows, right? You're looking, you know, you're throwing a dark, in a dark room, right, okay. where it lands. I, I believe 2024 is still going to continue to be a challenge for us, in terms of margin, right? So oh, our way, you know, from a guidance standpoint, I would say, you know, where we've historically been for the last two quarters, I would say that's probably a good guide for us, just because of where the deposit costs are. Once the deposit costs come down, we can certainly accelerate that. So can we talk about that, the deposit pricing? Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the, the um, you know, the pricing competition, you know, what the pricing trends have been like uh, in your market? Yeah. Yeah. So that's where, you know, we've been focused on a non-interest bearing. And, you know, as I mentioned, they've gone up from 9% to 13% of our total deposits. You know, uh, I, I was talking to a, a client yesterday and they got a 6% deposit from Wells Fargo, right? On a money market account, 6%. On money market. So I know people are talking about the big boys on, the big boys are absolutely driving these costs up, right? Oh. Um, so that's where some deposits, we are letting them run off because it's really, what have you done for me yesterday? And right. we're more focused on these long-term where, you know, they appreciate our white glove service. And that's what's going to drive our deposit cost down. So we do feel, yes, we're going to continue to see the pressure in the fourth quarter. The pressure I, right now, if rates stay where they are, the pressure will come down in the first and second quarter, but they, it will be elevated. And then the second half of next year, we'll see uh, better opportunities. Wow. Okay. Yeah. How long ago, I'm just curious, how long, how many weeks ago was that 6% competitor rate? Uh, it was on Monday. So, okay, so recent. All right. Um, and the the loan growth again. You're getting nice loan growth. Um, can you talk about that? Like, what kind of what kind of loans are you growing? What kind of pricing uh, is it at? And um, you know, a lot of the loan growth is somewhat stalled. I think in general across the industry because uh, people are reluctant to take on a high interest rate loan if they think interest rates might be stabilizing or going down in the future. But clearly, you're your customers, or maybe you can just talk about what's behind the loan growth. Yeah, so loan growth, uh, you know, it's all in market. We're not doing anything out of market, right? It's where we've had these relationships, as you can see from our market knowledge here for a very long time, right? And it's really out us in the competition. Mm -hmm. I, I, am, I see myself as a revenue generator. I don't sit in my office, I go out. And I, I think that makes the difference from our, our team standpoint is how we approach the customer from a holistic approach. It's not just an RM going out and they don't meet the management team. We are fully engaged with our customers. And I think that's really helped us from a long growth standpoint, right? And if you take these top 50 bars, or if you take the top 100 bars, I know each one of them, right? I go visit them once a year. Deposit customers, I visit them twice a year, top 100, right? So we know our customers very well inside out. As far as pricing is concerned, you know, we have put an eight handle in terms of pricing. And so we are losing some deals. We lost a deal yesterday to a local competitor at 6.25, right? It's okay, we'll, we'll live another day. We don't need it. So that's where, you know, we're pricing at 8% and I think that's uh, fair in this marketplace. Okay, all right. And, and what, what kind of loans are they? Are they like um, commercial real estate or? Uh... 
CNI. Yeah, CNI, yeah. And so yeah, are you they, able to get some deposits with that, uh, with the loan? We don't group? do it without deposits. Like if I, you know, the example I gave you of the Pizza Hut, it was a full deposit relationship. Otherwise, we, we don't do it. We, we walk away. Okay, okay. Um, uh, th We had another question. I'm sorry, I just saw it. Oh. I just saw two questions. I apologize. So, if your is your balance sheet liability or asset sensitive um, as of the the June and the September quarters? Do you have? I would to... say we are more liability. Okay. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. And um, okay, so so more liability sensitive, and that hasn't changed. That's been relatively yeah. stable. Yeah, okay. we've we've still got that hangover from that residential portfolio, the prior residential portfolio, right? So it's we're still more liability sensitive right right okay all right um i think is there anything else uh Jeanette, that we should um that we should be asking or anything no i appreciate uh, any investors we appreciate your capital you know we're stewards of your capital so we do appreciate your um faith and trust in us well thank you thank you very much for um for coming on and giving us an update and um yeah, it's been impressive what you've accomplished so thank you look thank forward you. to seeing it in the in the uh in the bottom line and put that in the stock price thank you thank you Jack. thank you Ann. all right thank you